Life Stories. Uh, can I just say it's an honour and a privilege to be here tonight, sharing a fellowship with each and every one of you, and to share the story of uh, my life before and after the Lord Jesus came into my life. And uh, so where do we begin? I suppose we, we'll begin at the beginning. Uh, I was born in this little town in the north of England called Wigan. And I was born into a non-Christian family and my mum and dad were married and I was the baby of uh, three children. I had four children, I had three sisters, a lot older than me. Uh, my mum couldn't afford much and uh, I think at one time I got embarrassed going to school dressed as a Japanese, Japanese admiral. But again, that's another story. But uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, I had, I had, I had an up and down upbringing. Uh, my mum was a wonderful person, obviously she was a mum and uh, a strong, strong character and she looked after us all, she worked all the time, she had a job in the factory and uh, I had a sad time in my life which I'll get rid of early doors and I used to go and stay at my father's at the weekend and uh, it was a pretty dark time in my life for a number of years I was abused by my father and uh, and I felt so guilty because of that. I, I, I took all the blame. I didn't, I didn't know how to tell people. I, I was warned by him if I told people. And uh, honestly, it was such a sad time. But, you know, even at that time, as a, as a young bloke, he didn't know any difference. Within, what, four or five years of it happening, God came into my life and uh, completely stopped that going on anymore. My sister completely stopped it. And... It's very hard. It's easy to forgive with the Lord, and I have forgiven, but the difficulty is forgetting. And, you know, I need prayer for, to be able to forget that time because there is triggers that, that kick it off, and uh, the devil has a prod and a probe, and, and sometimes uh, he wins a battle by me going into depression. But at the end of the day, praise God, I got over that, and uh, I started to get into sport. In fact, most of my life, until... Meeting Jesus Christ, sport became my God. And I was into football, I was into rugby league, I was into cricket, I was into every sport you could think of. It was an outlet, and I was an angry young man because of what had happened. And as, as Alan shared, which I've shared a number of times, that I got sent off on a rugby field, I had so much anger. And uh, a lot of the times as a kid growing up, I took the anger to other people because I saw the impression of... Uh, the person's face in, in what I was uh, opposed against. But I went to a local uh, junior school and then I went on to a secondary modern school, not like the academies today, they were called secondary modern schools. And I weren't very clever. I weren't very clever at all. I'm not sure in one year that the teacher said, Will, as you are, this other lad, Will, who's the stupidest in class. He said, we'll have to have a, we'll have to have a test between you. So I'm taking this test to give us 20 questions. And at the end of it, he said, Bill, you're the stupidest. And I went, why am I the stupidest? So he said, well, Bill, he said, look, he said, for 19 questions, you've both got everything right. He said, and for the 20th, Bill's put, I don't know. He said, and you put, neither do I. So again, I weren't that clever enough. I didn't get away with it. You know what I mean? But I was brought in. I was always brought up later on with a sense of humour. And I got into sport through school at 11 year old and I started playing rugby league. And at the age of 15, when uh, the day I left school on the Friday evening, I had a job to go to on the Monday. And that night we played a final at Wigan and during the game, some kid fell on my knee and they took me to hospital and uh, they told me they couldn't put it in plaster. And from leaving school at four o'clock, I was in a hospital bed with weights on my leg and I was in that bed for 18 weeks. And believe it or not, I, I grew four and a half inches in 18 weeks. My man went berserk, buy my new pants and everything else, he couldn't afford it. Well, that, that was rugby league, that was a sport. But the best thing that happened, ever happened to me in my life, when I turned 16, I met my wife, Sheila, absolute diamond. I've been so blessed with that woman. She is, she is a dream, she's a wonderful Christian woman. The experiences she's had, uh, which I'll share a little bit later on, is phenomenal. And I met Sheila at a uh, local dance hall. And it was funny, really. I was only 16. I know I shouldn't have been drinking, but 
that was the norm then when we were kids. And I was stood at the top of these railings near the bar and I saw this young lady came in and I fancied her straight away, if I could use that word, I don't fancy her. I fancied she was beautiful. So I'm stood at the top and all of a sudden the police walked in. And I got to the hearing stage and I'm listening, I'm giving it the wigging. And I heard her say, oh, I'm only, I'm only 17. It, it, if they get me, my mum finds out, she'll go mad. So well, that was my cue. So I just shot down and I went to the side of her and they were coming towards her. And I said, listen, Sheila. Well, I, I said, listen, love. I said, if you kiss me, they'll walk straight past you. And that's how I met my wife with a kiss and the police in the same environment. So uh, what, what, what was that for? For fate. Well, not fate, for luck. Because she, she'd been a rock. She'd been an absolute rock. So I was playing uh, soccer at the time and I was uh, having trials at Blackburn Rovers. Believe it or not, one of the players in the first team at Black Rovers Island at that time, Terry, was Dave Whelan. And uh, I'd had these couple of trials and I'd met Brian Douglas and I'd met Mike England and they were great blokes, had a chat and the manager, Johnny Curry, came over on the Saturday morning after the trial and he said, I'd like you to come to Blackburn. Well, I was so excited. I, I didn't know what to do. I had no dad. I had, no, I had nobody to help me, nobody to tell me what to do. So I came home. I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll go and have a chat with my sister's husband. Uh, and I was coming home with the news that uh, I could be a professional soccer player. But I was met at the door by Sheila's dad with his news that his daughter was pregnant. So... I gave up football and you know, we got married in February 1966, same year we won the World, the World Cup, 66, uh, in a Catholic church. We proceeded from there to, we had our first child, our Carl, and we had our second child, our Graham, then we had our third child, our Kathleen, uh, and that was in this country. Life Stories. three children and five grandchildren. From being a small boy, I was sent, sent to Sunday school every Sunday. And as I grew older, I carried on going to church for a while until in my teens, I stopped going to church. It didn't really much mean much to me. And I got involved in playing rugby. And uh, every Saturday after playing, we spend the rest of the day drinking and playing cards for money. And I get home on my, in the early hours of the morning, my motorbike, I don't know how I got home many times. When I finished my education, I was working in re as research and development physicist. And I was doing some research over, over a period of weeks, and one night I was working on my own all through the night to take continuous readings on a project. And I didn't know that a pipe carrying poisonous gas had broken, and poisonous gas was flowing into the room, and I was breathing poisonous gas. Suddenly I collapsed unconscious on the floor. Thankfully, a man was walking past. He saw me lying on the floor. He telephoned security people. And I was rushing to hospital. I was under oxygen for about five hours. I was at the edge of eternity, but God brought me back from the edge of eternity because he had a plan for my life. Now, that experience didn't make me seek after God. But what I had, I had a real fear of death. Two of my friends had been killed in accidents. And as a scientist, I realized death is not the end, that when you look at a dead body, all you see is an empty shell. The person who lived in that body is no longer there. They've gone somewhere, either heaven or hell. 
I got married to a wonderful wife and she gave birth to our first children. They were twin girls, but they only lived for two days. My wife never saw those children. I saw them, beautiful little girls. But I telephoned from the hospital and said, we're very sorry, but your children have died. I had to go to the funeral on my own and as I sat there looking at that box with my little girls in, I thought, why? Why did they only live for two days? And suddenly it was like a black cloud of fear came over me and I was shaking with fear and I thought, what happens when I die? My body's put in a box like that, buried in the ground, but that's just the body. Where's the person who lived inside, the person who looked through the eyes, who listened through the ears, who has feelings and emotions? And I realized that I would be in hell. I didn't want to talk about death, I didn't want to enjoy life. But a few months later, my wife's twin brother, 24 years of age, suffocated in his sleep. And that fear of death came back so great. No one ever told me what it says in the Bible, that one reason Jesus came was to set people free who all their lifetime were in bondage to the fear of death. But no one ever told me that. We did have another daughter, and I changed my job, and I went into education. I was teaching physics and mathematics, in a large comprehensive school. I was still drinking and got involved in gambling, gambling on racehorses, it became an addiction. I was gambling every day, I never told my wife how much money I was losing, and I just had an empty feeling inside. One day I met a man from an electronics firm, I was buying equipment from him. There was something different about this man, and he was asking me about my family and about my life, and I said, well, but my wife's expecting a baby, and the doctor said it could be twins, that we've already lost twins. And this man said, well, we will pray for you. I said, do you really believe in prayer? He said, we know there's a God who answers prayer. This man was a man who knew Jesus. I knew about Jesus, but this man knew him. He said to me, you are a sinner. You deserve to go to hell. I knew that was true. He said, but Jesus came and he died on a cross in your place. He took the punishment for your sins. He was buried after three days. He rose from the dead. He went back to heaven, and one day, very soon, he's coming back again for those people who know him. Not all the religious people, not all the people who go to church, but the people who know him. He said, if you will ask Jesus to come into your life, he will come into your life. He will take away all that fear, all that sin. He will give you a peace. He'll give you a completely new life. It sounded so good. I thought, can it be so true? Can that happen? He invited me to meet some of his friends, and I took my wife, and we heard wonderful testimonies. We were driving home late at night on a country road and as I came to a bend there was a bus coming in the opposite direction. A car overtook the bus and was coming straight for me. All I could see were the headlights of a car heading for me. I couldn't pull off at the side of the road, there was nowhere to go. I closed my eyes, I put my foot on the brake, just waiting for the crash. Nothing happened. I opened my eyes and nothing there. And I was shaking and I heard a voice and I believe it was the voice of Jesus. And he asked me a question, he said, where will you spend eternity? And I knew if I'd hit that car and I'd gone into eternity, I'd have been lost forever. When I got home that night, my wife's telephone was ringing. It was the man I'd been with that night. He said, what happened to you on the way home tonight? After you left, we were praying for you. Someone had a vision. They saw the headlights of a car heading straight for your car, and we prayed for you. I knew God was real. I fell on my knees. I said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've done so many things wrong in my life. Please forgive me. Please come into my life and give me that new life. Take away all this fear and sin. When I prayed that, Jesus came into my life and I was born again. I became a new creation in Christ Jesus. I felt a river of pure water washing through my whole body, washing all the fear and the sin away. And for the first time in my life, I was free. And I'm still free today because in the sunset free, the Bible says, is free indeed. God did so many wonderful things in her life. My wife became a Christian. We started following the promises of God and living by the promises of the Bible. And God called me to leave the work I was doing and to serve him. Like he called the disciples to leave the fishing nets and follow him. Like he called the tax collectors to leave their job and follow him. He asked me to leave everything and follow him. He said, you do this work that I'm calling you to do. I will supply your needs in a miraculous way. And you're in the center of my will. And for over 40 years, I've been traveling uh, over, in over 80 countries. I've traveled now and been sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. I've seen many, many, many miracles, all types of miracles. And one thing that's happened, I've prayed for many people who, who were unable to have children. When your dreams are crushed, all hope is fading. Hello, my name's Stuart Jones. I'm a postman from Wigan, and I'm a Christian. 
Now there was a time where I had no interest in God and Jesus. I couldn't be doing with the Bible and church. I used to think Christians were all a bit soft. And I definitely didn't want to be told what I could or couldn't do. Or think about the consequences of my selfish lifestyle. I wanted to enjoy myself. So living in a Christian home with a Christian parents, I soon left when I had the chance. And I was living in Wigan, in a bed sit, enjoying myself, living it up. But then one day I slipped on the snow at work and I fractured my leg. Now I split up from my girlfriend so I had nobody to look after me. So I ended up back up with mum and dad's. And it ruined my weekend, I'd already got, got planned for drinking and drugs, but I had to go back with mum and dad and it was like going to prison. And I was off work for six months. And I was, in the six months I got bored after a bit. I mean there was only four channels on the television at that time and, and, and John Peel on Radio 1 and that was it. So I ended up picking up one of my dad's books about angels and demons. And uh, after reading that I said I was in the mood for reading so I ended up picking one of my dad's Bibles up. Uh, uh, that which was written in a modern translation, the Living Bible. And I started reading from Genesis, right from, and I was determined to read all the way through. It took me two years to read through this Bible, not because I wanted to become a Christian, but I'd, like I say, I'd picked up an interest. And as I was reading the Bible, this God who I'd been ashamed of, I realised how awesome and majestic and powerful he was, the creator of the universe. And I knew that something in my life had to change. I knew there was going to be consequences for the sinful life I was living. But I didn't want to become a Christian. It was the consequences after my sinful ways that I wanted to change. The people who were closer to me, the ones who were hurt. So anyway, I was looking, I was on holiday in Whitby and I was looking out at the sea and the, star, in the sky. Again, thinking how awesome God was. And I knew I had to make a decision one way or other. And I made a decision to, to go to church and I used to hate going to church. But I went to church this night and uh, the preacher was preaching about you must be born again. Jesus' words, Jesus said that you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. So that's what I needed and that night I gave my life to Jesus. And I was born again and my life started to change. Now the reason I'm a Christian is because I'm a sinner. I am far from perfect. I need a saviour. Hello, I believe you've been watching the Life Stories videos this last week where people have been telling the story of how they've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and the change it's made in their life. I would like to invite you today to pray that prayer, to click on the link, the salvation link, and pray that prayer and commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. He didn't say, I will show you the way, I will show you the truth, I will show you the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the Bible says, this is life eternal, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And if you will pray that prayer today sincerely, then you will receive eternal life. You don't have to wait till after this life is over, but now you can receive eternal life, which begins now and which will continue and through all eternity. I pray that God will bless you. I pray that he will help you to find that peace which passes all human understanding. Jesus said, My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. And so I pray for these men, that, Lord, they will come to know you and they will experience that peace, Lord. Bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. He's with you in the waiting. So hold on, hold on He's with you in the waiting Hold on, hold on He's with you in the waiting Always with me by my side Stories. And I was playing soccer for Inch Parish Church. 
when I came home one evening and I picked up the local newspaper, and a friend of mine who played rugby league with me at school and signed professional terms with Wigan Rugby League Football Club, and uh, whether it be Admir Ad Ad Admiral Tier, admiring what he'd done, or big head in this, I don't know between the two because I thought, I always did, that I, I was a bit, a bit of a player than Bill. So I thought, I'll give it a go, I'll go play rugby. Well, I played two games. On only my second game playing rugby league, I was, I was, I was just turned 18. Uh, we played a team, believe it or not, at Adlington, a place called Adlington, another small village up north of England. When we beat them, I think it was about 134 nil. So I couldn't believe when a scout from Wigan came to me and said, listen, young man, he said, would you like to come to Wigan Rugby Club, Rugby, Wigan Rugby League for trials? Well, again, I didn't know what to do, but the coach of our team then was an old army sergeant, Mr. Wally Blake, and he said, go, he said, you've nothing to lose. <coughs> Pardon me. So I, I played my first trial at a place called Naughty Ash, where Ken Dodd came from in Liverpool, had a decent game. And then my second game, it was the middle of winter, we played working turn at Central Park, and coming off the pitch, the directors didn't let me go for a bath. They took me straight into the boardroom, full of mud and slutch and all sorts, and sat me around this board table, it was about boardroom table, about 12 directors. And the chairman looked and he said, we'd like you to sign for Wigan, young man. But I knew, I knew that people had said, if you sign professional rugby, you get, you get money. But I just got married and we had, we had our first child then. And I said, well, if I had to sign for your club, what, what will I get? So he said, well, we'll give you a thousand pounds. Well, my eyes went tic tac toe, George. You know what I mean? I've, a grand. I've, I've never, I was working 60 hours a week for 11 quid. He said, we'll give you a grand. I said, I'll sign. He said, well, hang on. He said, we won't give it you all at once. I said, well, what will I get then? He said, well, we'll give you 100 quid if you sign. No, I said, we'll give you 400 after so many games. 250 if you play for Lancashire, 250 if you play for Great Britain. I said, well, give me 101 pound notes and I'll sign. So I signed that night for Wigan. Went for a shower, a bath, there was no hot water. I ran it home full of sluts. I only lived about two miles away. I lived in a two up and two down in, in I rinse. And I threw went in the house and I threw the money at Sheila. I said, Sheila, I'm a professional rugby player. And that was uh, my introduction to professional rugby league. But as we all know, you know, and the Bible said the devil's the god of this world. As soon as I got into the first team, the devil grabbed me by the scruff of the neck. And for a number of years, my wife and my family were secondary to everything else what I did. And I got into the first team at a young age, and we used to have 25, 30,000 spectators watching the games at Central Park, which I'm sure Mr. Fanning, who's watching tonight, will, will tell you what I mean. And, and I'd heard of this idolatry and worshipping people. And, and I couldn't believe I'm 18 years old and I've got 25,000 people on Central Park after when I were playing and scoring tries, shouting King Bill, King Bill Ashurst. Absolutely unbelievable. But obviously the idolatry and the worship led to the womanising and people, women and girls so on so fat and the drinking uh, and everything else came with it. And I just got lost in that world. I, I, I did get lost in the world of the I was doing everything that I shouldn't do. And I'm just absolutely, I can never thank the Lord enough for the mother that my kids had. I didn't have a relationship proper with my kids. I spent time playing with them and blah, blah, blah. I was hardly ever in. It was all rugby league or it was all drinking or it was all fighting. I, 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 I had the odd scrap after the, after the, the boozing and... But it was on the pitch where I took out my anger on other people. I mean, believe it or not, someone from Australia sent me a, a piece last week and the headline was Ashes Sins. And I thought, third income, I'm still a sinner, but what sins have I done? And he had it written down. Uh, Ed Button, four matches banned. Fighting, four matches banned. Elbowing, four matches banned. Kicking, six. I think I was actually sent off 17 times. I believe half of that was bad decisions, mistaken identity, that's what I'm saying anyway. But I, I, I just, it was just a game that, believe it or not, I just wanted to be the best. And as a sportsman, whatever it took on that pitch, 
if they wanted to fight, I'd, I'd outfight them. If they wanted to play rugby, I'd outplay them. If they wanted to outkick, I'd outkick them. And it was always about wanting to be the best. And the modesty only came off the pitch, but on the pitch, when you cross that white line, it was it was battle, it was war. When I treated it as that, and obviously there's things where I, you'll hear a little bit later on that I was blessed that I could go to a lot of those people, like like Alex Murphy when I broke his jaw, I went to apologise to him, and like somebody else when. Uh, I broke his cheekbone, I went to and apologised to him. But it wasn't just a one-off thing, you know. It was six and seven, lived by the sword, he died by it. I've got plastic cheekbones. I've had 12 operations on my knees. I've done all my fingers. I've got stitches in my head and on my eye. And I didn't have the ball. The ball was 25 years away. We didn't have the ball. When we got, we got the ball, we didn't get hurt. When we didn't have the ball, we always got somebody to knock us down, man. It was unbelievable. But that was the game we played. It was an evil game. I thank God that today's game is a lot safer, it's a lot stronger, it's a lot faster. But I lived in that world. I lived in the world of nightclubs, I lived in the world of betting shops, I lived in the world of what shouldn't be. And I was at times a bad man, but this is the funniest thing about it. I was thick at school, but guess what? I was always top in religious education, always number one in religious education. As I've said to Alan and Sherry tonight, the Terry, that I think they're on Bible dyslexic because I love reading the Word of God, but they'll never stick in where they are. It's absolutely unreal. But again, we, we, we there came a time when I was I played for France. At, I played for Great Britain on three occasions. I played my first game in Toulouse against France, and then I played two tests against New Zealand. And. <laughs> Life Stories. Life Stories. 